of what I've done, where I've been, what I've been doing. You're going to see some that are called Kohana. That was um, our compounding pharmacy and regenerative medicine center. We operated in San Luis Obispo for about 12 years, uh, where a lot of this came from. A lot of the research came out of there and everything. So please don't uh, let that dissuade you uh, in any way. What we really figured out um, was that, yeah, we need homeostatic balance. Balance is everything. And then when, when the big uh, information hit about the endocannabinoid system, all they talked about was endocannabinoid balance and then putting everything together, all the research and papers and podcasts and everything kind of indicated this is something that is pretty important to us. So homeostatic balance is, the, is definitely the key to life. And um, the endocannabinoid system kind of regulates or governs just about every system. Um, I do want to give some credit here to some of the people that I think are phenomenal in this industry. The upper left is Dr. Rafael Mishulam, who Dr. Block mentioned last week, and I want to give Dr. Block a lot of credit for the presentation that he gave. He saved me a, son, a, a ton of time, not having to go into some of the old details and the laws and all that kind of stuff. And of course, speaking of the laws, I'm just going to say right now, everything's illegal. And then that way nobody gets in trouble. OK, so as he said, be careful if you if you're in a state that allows this, watch out for the federal government. Um, I'm going to show you one of the most interesting things that you've never heard uh, as we go along here. Speaking of regulatory agencies, FDA state boards, it strikes me as unbelievable. And when I get to that slide, I'll, I'll probably break into a sweat. But anyway, Dr. Mishulam is the upper left, and the upper right is uh, Dr. Ethan Russo, who um, I refer to as the American father of cannabinoid medicine. And then on the lower part, many of you will recognize Dr. Dustin Sulak. Um, I think he's a clinician supreme. If you ever listen to him, listen to his podcasts, uh, have his products, anything like that, uh, I consider him one of the world's foremost authorities in the treatment aspect of this. Obviously, Dr. Mishulam was research. Um, Dr. Russo is that way, too. I, I don't think either of them have quite the practice and the knowledge that Dr. Sulak does. And he's a member of Society of Cannabis Clinicians, one of the leaders there, of which I'm a member as well. If you need any more information on um, cannabinoid medicine and treatment, that is a phenomenal place to go. Okay. And then Dr. Russo said very simply, the endocannabinoid system regulates regulation. Okay, well, what does this mean? How does it do this? Well, we want the balance and we want optimal health. And this slide is the, as it says, the Kohana wellness to uh, all of the aspects that we feel need to be balanced for health. Um, you'll notice on here that there are these arrows and these arrows actually do mean something. Some of these things go both ways. Some of them are only one way. But if you notice on the right hand side, building the endocannabinoid system is is as going both ways with de detox and homeostatic balance and all of that. If you look at supplementation, there's not really anything here that uh, boosts supplementation. That's just something we got to do. Okay. And then here are the systems, the 12 systems that seek homeostasis. And on the top, you know, I pointed down there, the endocannabinoid system. This is where um, we can actually see effects of our endocannabinoids as well as phytocannabinoids, which obviously mean they come from plants, uh, on all of these systems, everything from endocrine to digestive, to reproductive, cardiovascular, everything is touched by the uh, endocannabinoids. And as an example of this in homeostasis, the human body is really adaptable, extremely adaptable. And you can see there with the, the gentleman, I don't know what he's doing, whether he's fishing or what out in side of an igloo, you know, extreme cold, right? Blood thickens, heart rate slows, metabolism slows. We adapt to that kind of thing. And then of course on the lower right, uh, yeah, we adapt to that too. Fight or flight type of thing, digestion slows, heart rate increases, pupils dilate, all of that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I think I found out recently that I guess everybody knew except me is that when you're in the fight or flight type of thing, your blood is able to coagulate faster I, in case you get bit. I did not know that. Okay. Now, when it's over, at the very bottom, when it's over, everything goes back into balance. How does that happen? 
you don't run out of adrenaline. It doesn't fall out of your body. And if another, you know, animal comes at you, you're going to get another boost of adrenaline, right? It's just, it doesn't actually completely go away or dissipate or get used up. What happens is the endocannabinoid system kicks in and starts to balance you back to the way you were. And this is how it is. It's back to hey, back. Dr. Quinn, stops the adrenaline. Yeah. can I interrupt real quick? Sure. You know, a lot of the, uh, veterans, uh, combat veterans specifically, and a lot of the um, uh, responders, first responders, after they go into extreme situations and they come out and they slow back down, quite a few of them have heart attacks or strokes because that system doesn't actually balance out. I'm wondering if the CBD would keep that from happening. It can, and Joel, uh, that's great. Thank you for the transition into my next slide because that's exactly what I'm showing here. But anyway, so let me let me cover this one and then we'll hit that. So when you go back into balance, right, uh, the endocannabinoid system, it's, it's regulatory. It was discovered in the 1990s, as Dr. Block mentioned, um, by um, uh, Raphael Meshulam. And as he mentioned, he, he I think he kind of proposed it and then others took off on it. Uh, Dr. Russo, Ethan Russo jumped on that thing and then talked about the entourage effect and, and then on it went. What I find interesting is that it's in almost all animals. I think they say, except for sea squirts or something really weird like that. And you're born with it. And it's there, even if you've never even heard of cannabis, you have an endocannabinoid system and we'd be dead without it. What I like to, to have people think about is something rather um, amazing to me is that if we're born with an endocannabinoid system and we have endocannabinoids, then, and, and our bodies know how to handle these, obviously, um, why is it that sometimes people are against using cannabinoid medicine in pregnancy? I mean, we all panic and we all jump and go, well, that's, that's got to be a class C, can't do it, right? Well, you know, there are some things coming out that say maybe you can, and if somebody has intractable seizures or something like that, that that's going to cause, you know, an abortion type of situation, maybe you got to do that or nausea, you know, th throwing up completely all of the time. Uh, maybe this is an answer to it. And again, just to get you to think, why can't we augment that in, in mothers? I don't have that answer. Joel, here's your slide. Okay, so memory and stress. And we depend upon this for balance, but we don't always get it. Now, if you look on the pictures on the right, there's your picture of a highly stressful situation in combat, okay? And this, the picture on the left, I think, is New York City, downtown. And this is what is pretty cool about what the endocannabinoid system does, is it helps you forget. It helps you forget. So if you're walking down the street, on this busy street and you look around and you see cars and you see buildings and you see lights and you see people and you see dogs or whatever you see, right? You do not memorize everything that you saw. The endocannabinoid system allows you to be selective and to forget. And as Joel mentioned over here on the right with the combat, that's what we want in a lot of cases to happen. We don't want those memories that may be burned into the brain. And there are a lot of different studies out, uh, uh, almost as many uh, studies as there are theories on how the CBD and um, I'll generally say CBD and I, and I mean cannabinoids, um, how this may help this type of situation. And it, it's there's a lot of experimentation done on this, Joel, and a lot of people have got tremendous success. Um, I think that uh, if we combine this with psychomimetic or whatever you want to call these kind of things, this type of medicine that's more or less um, powerful on the brain, whether we talk about psilocybin, you know, and the, and the 5 HT um, 2 A receptors, uh, the serotonin receptor, the psilocybin hits, CBD also hits that receptor. Okay. And then so MDMA, you know, for PTSD, there are a lot of things that are coming out right now that I say coming out. They've been in research for decades. And now I think we as a people are starting to realize that there might be some better things that are there that we might be able to take advantage of. And there are a lot of studies going on with this. When I mentioned in the beginning, watch out for the illegalities. 
Uh, that, of course, is the catch-22, federally illegal, so it's hard to get supply, it's hard to get approved to do a study. And from what I understand, I haven't tried this, they say that if you want to get approved for a study, whether it's NIH or somebody and you want grants, you have to call it marijuana. And we can get into where that name came from, right? And I refuse to use that. That's that's derogatory and racial. Um, and then you also probably better have in there something about you don't think it works. And you got a chance of getting the, the study funded. Now, that's hearsay. I have not done this myself, but... Uh, it, it makes sense to me and the people that I've talked to have kind of, you know, they shake their head and say, mm, yeah, that's pretty much it. OK. Now, this stress management thing is really pretty cool. If you look in, the, in this box and these stupid little arrows, this is something that that I, I did because I'm bad at this. But if you're giving a presentation, OK, and if you see it on the bottom left and you're at presentation number one, right? Your endocannabinoid system is kind of low and your cortisol, right? Your stress management system is pretty high, all right? Okay, so the second time you do it, presentation number two, your endocannabinoid system is kind of aware of what is happening. And so it gets higher and your stress seems to be a little bit lower. By the time you get to the third one, you can see what's happening right? Your cortisol before the thing gets lower. If the third time you give a presentation, you can actually eat before you get it, give it. Whereas in the first time, there's no way you're going to be able to eat. You're too nervous. Okay. And then by the time we get to the fourth one, everything is normal. Everything is balanced out. And you probably don't even feel as much adrenaline as you did at the first time. This is how the endocannabinoid tone comes in. And that's a very critical type of term, endocannabinoid tone. All right. Now, the endocannabinoid system itself, they say is ubiquitous, is pervasive, and it's critical and it plays a key role in many nervous system functions. And I just picked a couple here out of that, that crazy chart that had 12 of them. The nervous system and, and check this out. I mean, everything from pleasure all the way down to, you know, to pain and integration of the of the senses, but notice the second one is memory and forgetting, okay? And neuroplasticity, which is really a big buzz thing happening now on all the things that we can do to maintain our cognition through neuroplasticity, this also helps. And then the immune system, right? Um, gene transcription, all of these other things, anti-pro-inflammatory cascades, tons of stuff for the immune system. And when you're when you're helping the immune system, I think you're also kind of hand in hand. Um, you know, it's one of those reversible arrows with uh, uh, the immune system. And, and as far as, oh, I, I guess you'd say any, anything that kind of causes an inflammatory type of response. Now, features of the endocannabinoid system. There are three parts. That's it. OK, and boy, is it complex and confusing. We've got the receptors. Right? And then we have the ligands and the receptors most common, you know, is the CB1, CB2 and now CB3. They're talking about individual ones in the brain. And these are the ones that people talk about. I have a slide here that shows you there must be God, 30 different type of receptors. Um, this is what is known as a promiscuous type of substance, whether it's our endocannabinoids or phytocannabinoids, they touch everything. You just can't limit it to one thing, right? So uh, those are the ligands. Now, um, the arachidonal ligands, most common are AEA, which is arachidonal ethanolamide, otherwise known as anandamide, and then 2-AG, which is 2-arachidonal glycerol, right? And then the one in green here, PEA, um, if I don't... Uh, cover this enough, I will be angry with myself because through the research that I've done for a number of years, this is one of the most fantastic products, molecules, chemical uh, compounds, supplements, whatever you want to call it, palmitol ethanolamide. It is phenomenal and everybody uh, can benefit from this type of thing. And then the last part of it, the third part are the enzymes, which, uh, which make them and break them. They either make, they're responsible for making the uh, ligands or breaking them down enzymatically. 
And then the balance of all this, again, is referred to as uh, ECS tone. And then when you have um, decreases in the tone, that gives you a host of physiological problems. Um, and then it has been categorized and characterized as endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Now, since we're talking about syndromes right here, I'm going to touch a little bit. I don't have slides on this, but just a little bit because Dr. Block mentioned this, the hyperemesis syndrome, right? And that's due to THC. And that's not most people that are on this call. Um, can't say completely. This generally comes from people who do high dose THC routinely over a long period of time. And as he mentioned, the crazy thing is the only thing that seems to stop that is getting in the shower. I don't even, I mean, the, Dr. Russo has gone into a lot of uh, deep dive into how that works and all that kind of stuff. And I say there's a very small percentage of that, but as we all know, uh, negative publicity sometimes carries the day. And once they discovered this, that, oh, that's all some people needed to say, oh, it's, it's a bad drug. I think you're going to have to try to get that. That's, that's what I truly believe. You're going to have to use a lot of THC over a long period of time routinely to try to get that type of thing. It's just not that easy and it's not that prevalent. And the treatment is, or, or the answer is, you have to stop. Uh, there's no such thing as it going away and not coming back. As far as I've read in the literature, you have to stop and you're done. And that's that's horrible for a lot of people out there. And we don't need to go into that type of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, the receptors in the endocannabinoid system are the most abundant protein receptors in the human body. There are more CB receptors in the brain than any other combination of receptors in the entire body. The second most prevalent area for CB receptors is the uterus. And that is why um, cramps can be relieved through phytocannabinoid use. Um, I've got a stepdaughter with this personal experience. It's unbelievable just unbelievable. Uh, you know, you don't want to go to ER and, you know, get shots of Demerol or whatever they're doing nowadays in there. That's just not the answer. This has really, really helped. Okay. Um, features of the endocannabinoid system. And here are the, the, the chemical structures of, of the two main endocannabinoids, right? An andamide and 2-AG. And notice these are the things that I just had talked about, the three separate parts of the system, the, end, the endogenous ligands. And then uh, here's where some of the receptors are that these things hit. And then here's some of the enzymes that will degradate them. The one that's most popular is, they call it FA, F-A-A-H, that's folic acid, anamide, hydrolyze, some, I, I mess that up sometimes, but uh, that's the main one that, that kind of breaks these down. And, and notice, um, the similarities in structure here. I know we're all chemistry majors like me, so we, we appreciate these structures. Uh, um, it, it, here's a, a little slide here with just showing you pictures of, uh, I think it's kind of neat, the postsynaptic uh, uh, nerve uh, and, and presynaptic nerve areas. This is what is critical to understand. Two main things here. Most of our neurotransmitters um, go presynapse to postsynapse, right? Very, very obviously. Um, you, you stick a pin in your finger, pain is in the brain, you feel that. The neurotransmission goes, you know, from your finger to your spinal cord to your brain and back and says, you know, ouch, don't do that. Um, now, the endocannabinoid system, and this is endocannabinoids and phytocannabinoids work in a retrograde manner. First of all, they are not stored in vesicles like our neurotransmitters are. Neurotransmitters are stored and they are released bango really fast. Okay. And as we all know, <clears throat> it's, it's not always a regulated type of thing. Someone can scare you and the, you know, <clears throat> your adrenaline flies and, it, and maybe it, it's way over what it should be. And it may take you a few minutes to calm down, even though you know what it was, you can, you can, uh, cognate on that and say, well, you know, it, it shouldn't be that bad, but man, my heart's still beating. Okay. So what brings it back? The endocannabinoid. And how does it do that? It works retrograde. It goes 
from the postsynapse to the presynaptic area to stop the release or at least inhibit the release of the neurotransmitters. The big difference is this. Our endocannabinoids are not stored. They're made on demand, right? So if you have pain, something like that, that is where the endocannabinoids are going to work uh, most prevalently. They're not going to be inhibiting your digestion or promoting your digestion at that time, right? I, I hope I'm clear on this, that these are site-specific. They are not stored. Um, the endocannabinoids and uh, are, are subject to this pattern. The phytocannabinoids, and I cover this again in another slide, the phytocannabinoids are not, right? Whether it is CBD or THC or CBN or CBG or C, you know, any of these things, these cannabinoids go everywhere. And that is my answer to when people say, well, this is just hocus pocus. I mean, my neighbor, you know, uses CBD for, for pain. My other neighbor, menstrual cramps. My friend uses it for irritable bowel syndrome. Oh, wait a minute, seizures. Oh, come on. How can it do that? Well, we've got these receptors all over our body and the phytocannabinoids are indiscriminate. They go everywhere and they act where, where they're needed. And I think that's really important. And, and also the other important thing is, as far as I know now, there is no way to measure the amount of endocannabinoids that you have unless you do some type of a lumbar puncture or something like that, which they don't allow that here. Uh, it's my understanding that some countries during their experimentation stuff will allow this to measure levels of anandamide. I don't know that for a fact. I just know that we cannot do that here. So if somebody has an endocannabinoid deficiency or deficiency syndrome, it comes up as a list of symptoms and we have a whole slew of things that we use to treat this type of thing. And guess what? It's just like everything else, right? Diet, exercise, detox, supplements, the whole thing, right? All that boosts the endocannabinoid system. When I was talking about the receptors and that type of thing, here's a little list of some of the things that it, uh, that it hits. Okay, including COX-2 and all of these PPAR and PPAR gamma and all of these different things, the uh, the trip Vs, everything. It's again, it's a promiscuous type of situation. It's just it's it's not really readily discernible um, to say here's the only action that it has, and that's probably why it does so many things. Then here's another one of these slides for people that like this kind of thing, and then you can notice on the right that uh, folic acid amide hydrolase the FAW enzyme breaking these things down. I won't spend too much time on that. <clears throat> this I think is important, and that's the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Um, and the thing that I find interesting, it can be congenital or acquired. They, I think we've all heard of these cases where somebody doesn't feel pain there was a famous case out of the UK of a woman who didn't feel pain and they were scared to death, you know, that, that she was going to hurt herself and which she did and, and didn't know it. She could break a bone and wouldn't feel it, burn herself, wouldn't feel it. Um, I believe she has since passed away, but apparently it was an overabundance of anandamide, which blocked all the pain receptors, right? So this can happen, and that's why I put in here, it can be congenital or, or it can be acquired through the deficiency syndrome. And then most of the disease states are marked by these type of things right here, mood imbalances, stress-related disorders. When we talk about stress and anxiety, I want to point out here that the prevailing attitude is that CBD alone, CBD isolate, can be effective for anxiety. Other than that, you're going to find that it requires pretty much the entourage effect or at least full spectrum cannabinoids that one of them by themselves is not going to be therapeutically valuable it takes the whole group and then contributory factors here age gender menstrual cycle diet all of these things that we know about lack of sleep stress 
all of these things that are pounded into our heads on every lecture that we hear that we need to take care of this type of thing. Um, at the bottom, these maladies proven to be directly related to the deficiency syndrome, migraine, fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel syndrome um, are some that if you, if you read any of the uh, studies put out by Dr. Russo, his famous one is called Taming THC. Phenomenal, phenomenal paper. Um, and it, and it's, it's older than you'd believe, but it, it's got tremendous information in there. And where I, I think he goes into these type of things where the, this is quote unquote been proven as much as we're gonna get proof on it, that it works. And then endometriosis. OK, can help with this as well. And that and that's just uh, cells gone wild. Right. I mean, they're they're cells that have escaped the uterine cavity and gone into the gut and all of this. And, and we have um, a tremendous diversity of symptoms that uh, ladies have that it is very difficult to diagnose. You can't tell what it is in a lot of cases. And so it, it can be endometriosis and it's proposed that uh, cannabinoids will help in that situation. Now, when I mentioned, how do we treat this, the deficiency syndrome, and this is the stuff that we know, that we hear about, that we do all of the time, right? Heal the gut, okay? Prebiotics, probiotics, you know, eat right, avoid pro-inflammatory foods, eat good fats, omegas, right? The proper omegas. Exercise, muscle is the currency of longevity. I think that if we go back to caveman days, that the most important thing that we had was muscle. If you didn't have it, you didn't eat. You couldn't catch anything. You couldn't do anything, right? So over the evolutionary period, um, we know that we need to exercise and have muscle. And what does that do? It also boosts the endocannabinoid system. And then family health. And what this basically is, is, is not a genetic type of thing I have here, like eye color. Now, you know, endocannabinoids aren't going to do anything with that, but you have to be mindful of unhealthy habits that you have. Um, that would be, I guess, watching NFL football on Sunday in your easy chair and eating popcorn and bonbons and not getting up. That is a pretty uh, unhealthy type of habit. That probably will uh, contribute to the deficiency syndrome. And then of course, sleep. There's so much stuff out now on sleep. It's unbelievable to, to balance everything. Um, and then uh, cannabis as a supplement. We can use, and I, and I put here, consider the use of, right? Because we are, we're dancing that legal line where sometimes um, we can get into hot water if, if we, um, recommend too strongly something like this. And um, if you step back and you take a look at why, um, well, if, if these things didn't work, then they wouldn't worry about people recommending them or people using them. But since they work, now they're worried about it. So that's how you get in trouble. Okay. And I think we all, we all know what that that's like with the regulatory agencies and that kind of thing. Okay. But for the right person in the right set and setting, uh, endocannabinoid um, boosts uh, with the phytocannabinoids can be a, a very helpful thing. Let's leave it at that. And then treating the uh, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And, and here's a little, uh, little molecules of what happens here. Uh, keep in mind, and this is important, I should have yellow highlighted it, that THC has stronger binding affinity for receptors than anandamide does. It will knock those things out of those receptors. And if I don't say it in the future somewhere, I will tell you right now, THC bonds to receptors, CBD does not. It is a negative allosteric modulator. It modifies the receptor site and can cause inhibition of THC binding. And so some people, if there's if they take too much THC, some people will actually try to take a lot of uh, CBD to lessen the effect of the THC. And that brings up the point when there are therapeutics here and people who are um, cannabis naive and they uh, take oral products, the onset of action is very slow. Dr. Block covered this last week. Onset of action can be 30 minutes to an hour and people get into trouble for two reasons. They don't think it's working and they take too much 
And then the second reason is that when you ingest THC orally, it is broken down into, you know, Delta 9 THC is what we're talking about. It is broken down into 11 hydroxy THC, which is stronger than Delta 9. So your um, psycho type of effects are going to be enhanced even more. The intoxicating effects, we'll call it, are going to be enhanced even more. And that's why sometimes people get into a little bit of problems taking oral if they don't know what they're doing. And in one of my slides here, I have, if, if this is recommended to anybody, we always suggest that you get a, a professional type of help. And I'm not really talking about bud tenders or um, as Dr. Sulek calls them, dispensary agents. And I'm not talking about that. I, those people worry me because um, it, you know a, a, a patient who may need a CBD type of thing can go into a dispensary and say, you know, well, I, I, I take um, Vasotech. Is it okay if I take CBD? And you go, Oh my God, this, this, this naive person is going to answer this question, you know, so that kind of scares me. So I think people should seek professional type of input. There's uh, strong pharmacy groups that provide this type of information for free. They go through the polymorphisms, you know, um, the cannabinoids are, are, uh, what is it? CYP 3A, CYP 2C9 are, are the enzymes that degradate these. And if you if certain medications, you have that problem as well. So there can be interactions there. Some of the interactions are, as we say, theoretical drug-drug interactions. Some of them do exist and some of them are not real uh, powerful, but should be noted. Um, and here's my favorite one. This is pontilethanolamide. It's produced endogenously and exogenously, uh, palms, egg yolk, soy. And the structure, and I will show you the structure of this, it is, looks more like anandamide than the cannabinoids do. And it's synthesized by all of our cells and it's produced in high levels during stress to the body. And it influences the endocannabinoid system receptors um, and it doesn't bind directly, but it enhances the endocannabinoid system activity and it can reduce mast cell activation. Right, which I think there's a lot of information coming out on mast cell activation and PEA can actually uh, help with that type of situation and neuroprotection, pain relief, anti-inflammatory, and it stimulates PPAR receptors. And it is a direct FA inhibitor. Okay, Competitive binding is greater than anandamide. Okay? And then it has direct uh, action on the so-called CB3 or the, the G protein coupled receptors, GPR55. GPR55, I think, is involved in, in cancer, but I'm, I'm not really uh, too versed in that. Okay, and then here's the structures of, of uh, anandamide and, and PEA. And, I mean, these are incredibly similar. I mean, look at, and the lower left, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, is not even close. Uh, it's not even an, an enantiomer, even when the, the when the carbons um, twist and all these things. You know, we can't think of these things as two dimensional; they're three dimensional. And the and the and the planar type of structure, the the benzene ring, um, generally is tilted, uh, and and that does not look anything like anandamide. However, PEA sure does. There, there are no ring structures in it, uh, no saturated uh, benzene ring structures. So uh, this stuff um, can really help augment the uh, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Um, just as a little plug here, we put this in the products that we make and it's our little secret thing. And um, I always dare people out there, these other CBD manufacturers, yeah, give it a try. Try to put that in there. This stuff does not play nicely with things. It is hard to incorporate, but it is so valuable, okay? Moving on with this. Um, don't pay attention to the thing on the right, the Kohana prism thing. That's corporate stuff. But misconceptions. Cannabis is good for everyone and everything. And that's just not true. Uh, the other one, CBD, that's the good cannabinoid. THC is the bad one. That's, that's wrong. CBD is the driving force. No, it, it is not the driving force. As they say, THC drives the bus and all the other endocannabinoids are helping, right? Cannabis has no side effects. That is not true. And then isolate. And this is the big one in the market today. 
CBD isolate, they love to put, they love to put THC free, right? CBD isolate. Well, CBD isolate is extremely weak. I think of it in this kind of terms. CBD, if you look at a certificate of analysis or you do any kind of chemical analysis of a plant and you look at the phytocannabinoid uh, components of this plant, you're going to find that most of the time, uh, CBD will be dominant unless it's been bred out. And why is that? Why did nature do that? Because CBD is a weak molecule. In order to balance that plant, and remember the plant produces these things for itself, not for us. It produces these things to ward off you know, bugs and then also terpenes to get out there and the smell and it brings in pollinators. It does everything for itself, okay? So when, um, when we talk about the, the chemical constituents of these plants, CBD is pretty weak. It requires a lot to balance that plant. Hence, it requires a lot if it's being extracted to produce therapeutic effects. And I think most of us know that, um, that the first CBD was done by GW Pharmaceuticals, who is now called Jazz. Um, and they came up with Epidiolex for seizures and um, for Dravet syndrome and Lennox Gestalt syndrome in children. Um, until that stuff came out, I don't think I, I even heard of those, those seizure syndromes. Maybe that's just me. Uh, very, very rare. A whole lot of it is required, a whole lot. And it to isolate CBD, to make a CBD isolate as opposed to a full spectrum product, it takes not only a lot of the, comp the original compound, the original cultivar, but there's extra steps in the processing. So it's harder to do and it doesn't work as well. But we like to say that it's popular that way. And then people will claim CBD effects. Now, if you go back to the days of Dr. Mishulam and all of the studies and all of the things that were done in Israel and everywhere else, and by the way, I just love this fact, back in the 60s, and I, and I, I can't speak for today, but cannabis is totally illegal in Israel. It was then. The supply that he got came from the U.S. We supplied him to do the research on it. Okay, So all of the research that came out was on basically on full spectrum products, but the marketers here in the U.S. decided that they would claim therapeutic effects of the full spectrum as being attributed to the CBD because there's a lot of it there, and that's the monomolecular thinking. One drug, one dose, or multiple doses, one effect, one disease state, right? And that's not the way nature does it, okay? We don't have that out of nature. I mean, you, you can't even eat an orange and just get vitamin C out of it, right? There are other things in there, right? That's the way nature does it. And I, and I believe that's the way that it was intended to be, all right? And so some of our concepts are down here. I won't bore you with this kind of stuff, but at the very bottom, if cannabis is used as a treatment modality, one needs professional assistance. And I think that's very true. And if there's anything that you need to know, I would say, I don't know if you can see this, uh, pick up this book by Dr. Sulak, right? This is phenomenal, handbook for, uh, uh, of cannabis for clinicians. Got everything in there. Okay, so if you, if you need to know that or you have answers, and what I tell a lot of people is, and especially pain management physicians, if someone comes to you and asks you about your opinion on cannabis and does it work for pain and does it work for this? And if you say no, they're going to find somebody else who's going to say yes because they kind of know the answer. They've either experienced it or they've heard about it or they've read about it and all of that, right? Um, so I, I don't think any of us should have our eyes and minds closed to this type of thing. Okay, now endocannabinoids versus phytocannabinoids, and some of the this is just in slide form, and and I've talked about these things already. Difficult to make uh, the endocannabinoids are needed in site specific phytocannabinoids, uh, indiscriminate, and they're non-targeted sites of activity. We talked about that already. 
Okay, characteristics of cannabis. Okay, now here's the thing. Strains. This gets me because strains, that's a microbial term. The, the mycologists and all of these people, that, that's what microbes are, they're strains. These are cultivars. Um, roses are cultivars, they're not strains, right? And what has happened with crossbreeding, the terms indica and sativa actually are no longer apropos. They've actually done uh, studies where they've given people the product and they've asked them to uh, tell me if this is an indica or a sativa. And in a huge percentage of the time, they get it wrong. They just don't know. Indica in the proper uh, vernacular, indica stands for indicouch. So that's supposed to be sedating and sativa is supposed to be more creative and mind focus and all of that kind of stuff. But with crossbreeding, we don't know if these things even work anymore. Um, the, the plants themselves don't look the same. For a long time, uh, way back when, when people were growing outside, they would want to grow the indica plants and the cannabis plants as opposed to hemp or sativa strains because the sativa strains and hemp grow really tall and thin. And the thing was, they said, well, helicopters can come over and they can find you that way. So you better grow the small plants. And so they started crossbreeding them to get the effects they wanted and, and on it went. Okay. And so some of the other characteristics, um, they may help to unbundle psychological distress syndromes. One thing that is kind of prevalent and it's very difficult to measure is they talk about standing next to your pain. The only way that I can kind of um, say something that might be uh, related to this is that if if you've ever like uh, sprained an ankle, let's say, the first time you do that, um, psychologically, you are a mess. I mean, you don't know when that's going to go away. You don't know how that's going to heal. You don't know if you can limp around on it. You don't know why it's so purple. You You just are totally unaware of that. All right. The next time you do it, you are not nearly as stressed out. You know, it's going to take a couple of weeks. Yeah, the purple goes down. The swelling is going to go down. I'm going to be fine. OK, that is kind of what these cannabinoids do with pain is it's almost like you've been through it. You're standing next to it or you can look at it more objectively than you did before and it was subjective and you experienced every negative thing and now it's almost like the guy next to you is like oh yeah yeah i know yeah yeah the pain and i know it's there but uh, i can still enjoy the movie you know whatever it is and, and i think that is an extremely important aspect of this and at the bottom in bold and yellow cannabis reduces suffering opioids don't do that I think they bring on a little suffering. All right, and then I got to throw these things in here because this is all of the things that you can find any place. Notice in the upper right how old this is, more than 85 cannabinoids. Oh man, there's more than 120. And it, the reason I have this in there is just because if needed, you can find charts on this if per chance you are interested or you have patients that want to know or whatever, you can find certain cultivar dominant cannabinoids that will target certain things. And, and here they are. Notice at the top, CBD and anxiety. Okay. So a lot of this stuff, combination THC, CBD, right? And here you go, Joel, uh, PTSD, depression, stress, right? These things have been shown to help. And remember, as we all know, it's really difficult to, to do clinical studies. You know, double blind crossover is almost impossible on this because people know what they're getting. Um, and, and it's hard to get product. Um, they tell me that if you get the University of Mississippi stuff, that it's better than it used to be. Um, it used to be laughable. The quality and the fungus that was in it was laughable. And I think they picked up their game. And I also heard University of Kentucky or somebody like that is also now allowed to uh, provide this. I don't know who does the studies on it, but they are the providers. Um, here's another little chart right here, a little bit easier to read. Um, and it's kind of neat because these are the cannabinoids that kind of show these type of effects. And, and this is, what, what are we going to say? As clinicians, we're going to say, yeah, that may work. But as scientists, we're going to say, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see all the evidence. And 
when I, I, I tell people is that if, if this stuff didn't work, why would people still be doing it? And if you've experienced any of this yourself, these things do work. This is not hocus pocus medicine. This works. And then here's some characteristics. And the one that I like to point out, and until proven otherwise, THC can actually kill cancer cells, but CBD can only inhibit the growth. And that is an important characteristic. If there are cancer people that decide that they want to take CBD isolate from the local dispensary because they have cancer. Uh, or and I and I won't say dispensary. I should change that to say CBD stores. I know here in Las Vegas, I mean, we have CBD stores. They don't sell THC, and then of course we have dispensaries that sell the THC and are kind of averse to anything with CBD in it. Well, if somebody goes into to a store and, and they get a CBD product and they think it's going to cure their cancer, they're sadly mistaken. It might help, but as we all know, there's so much more to it. Don't look to this as a sole agent and don't expect CBD to knock out cancer. It's just not going to do it. Um, the other thing is, as we say, can cause euphoria. And as Dr. Block mentioned last week, um, in the 80s, they came out with a product called Marinol, which was straight THC. And instead of euphoria, it caused dysphoria. Um, I dispensed a bunch of that. Okay. We call them Marinol balls because they just roll around uncontrollably. It's hard to, to count them, right? <laughs> Too bad. Pharmacist problem. But uh, uh, they didn't work very well at all. And I did not have a single patient that ever wanted a refill. They said, no, I'll go back to smoking. This stuff doesn't work and it makes me feel like crap. So there you go. Now, directly stimulates the 5-HT1 serotonin receptors as, as um, Dr. Block mentioned, you know, um, psilocybin and all of that's an entirely different lecture that we could go. I mean, I can give you hours on these 5-HT1 and what psilocybin does on these receptors and how it works in the different areas of the brain in which it works. And I mainly point this out for Joel and, and those guys. My heart goes out to the veterans. Part of our company, we, we donate um, part of our profits to wounded warriors, things like that, okay? We believe that that these people should be treated with the best thing there. And although I spent my, uh, my entire career messing around with the various pharmaceutical drugs and whatnot, um, I'm kind of sour to that, let's say. Yes, there's a place for it. If you've got a clot, yeah, get a clot and you're, you're in trouble, give me some Activase, yeah, I need that. Yeah. But otherwise... Uh, some of the uh, the chronic management things, we're not doing the right thing. We're using acute medicine to treat chronic problems, as we all know, and it doesn't work that well. And so, when we have things that work, I believe that they should be they should be used real quickly. The SSRIs, which I believe will become obsolete um, sometime, whether it's in a year, five years, or twenty years, they'll become obsolete because they are basically horrible drugs. They do not hit the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor, right? They do not hit that. But they, and, and as I've mentioned before, I never know what it meant when it said, oh, these are SSR. What is selective serotonin reuptake? What does that mean? Well, it's selective receptors. And what you need to know is psilocybin hits them all. That's nature. And that's the way it's meant to be. And that's why it, it can increase neuroplasticity and all of these things that SSRIs don't do. And then, of course, what happens if you don't have enough serotonin? Well, then the reuptake inhibitor is not going to do a very good job, right? So on we go. I'll get off the soapbox here. But uh, again, these products are phenomenal. And, and I think what's, what's really cool is if you look at the very top of this slide, the chemical composition is the same, 21 carbon atoms, 30 hydrogen, two oxygens, okay? And to a chemistry geek like me, this is impressive. It's just, a, you know, you can see down here in the little picture in the red, the difference, but oh boy, the therapeutics different. I mean, that, that's, that's for sure, right? And then characteristics of THC, we talked about this. What I think is funny is that if you look at some of the literature, Euphoria is classified as a side effect. Wow. Okay. I try to wrap your head around that one. Okay. Um, 
And then uh, down in the CBD mechanism is completely different. I, I don't know if, if you want to look at some of these things um, here. Uh, you know, I just glanced through the THC thing. I'm, I'm trying to make sure we get, you know, cover all this stuff. Um, uh, there are what I talked about on that, that greater acceptance of illness in current situation. That's a real thing. Hard to measure that. Um, greater appreciation of surroundings, improved focus, you know, the, um, the, the memory thing, the short-term memory loss um, can be mitigated by getting cultivars with alpha pinene in there that helps focus. Um, and uh it, it, the, the short-term memory loss, they say at parties is real funny when somebody forgets where their keys are, but if it's something that's important, it's not so funny, and it can be mitigated with the proper terpene uh, concentrations, which, you know, we'll hit here in just a second. Um, here is something that I find interesting that shocked me, and I had to put this in. Hemp oil right over here and tells you all of these different characteristics, but look at cannabis oil. I mean, it is way more effective. And I, I just don't like the thing over here where there's GMOs and all that kind of stuff. The, the trans fats, there's additives in hemp oil. It, it's just not a good idea. I think it might be real good for textiles, but that's about it. Okay. And I'm just kind of taking a break here to, to give you a chance to maybe look at some of this kind of stuff in case any of this interests you. And again, if you want to pop back to it, the, the slides are on the left-hand side here. Um, let's go to isolate versus full spectrum. I covered a little bit of that. Um, one thing that's important here is that CBD isolates have a biphasic dose response curve. So you, you take a bunch of it and it can help, it can help, it can help, goes up, peaks, and then you take more and you take more and then the response, it starts to go down and you get worse, right? So the old adage, if a little is good, a lot is better, does not hold. And one thing I think is extremely fun is that hemp is the second best heavy metal plant chelator in the world. I believe sunflowers are number one. Don't hold me to that. Why is that important? Well, not only did they plant hemp all over Chernobyl, but they won't do it for Daiichi Fukushima, right? Because they don't allow it. Um, but what's important here then is that where the plants are grown. California is known to have heavy levels of arsenic in the soil in various areas throughout the state. Right. These plants are chelating these metals inside the plants. Right? And then people who are smoking this, to me, it's like mainlining heavy metals. All right. Isn't it the same kind of thing? Because burning does not burn off a heavy metal, right? You, you know, the, it's not hot enough to do that when you're smoking these things. Um, you got a better chance with in, ingestibles, topicals, rectals, trochies. You, you got a better shot at maybe your body kind of uh, helping to, to detox some of this stuff. And we don't even want to get into the, the pesticides. I will give you an example on this. Um, pesticides in this, you can take your product to various labs. And there's a lot of testing labs out there and they're not standardized, right? So you can be using certain pesticides. And in some cases, you can find a lab that does not test for that pesticide, that chemical in that pesticide, let's put it that way. And now you are able to show that you have a clean product. This is criminal. I do not like this. The other example I will give you is that in San Luis Obispo, where I came from, um, I talked to a lot of growers there. I had patients who were growers. And what they said was they had organic pesticides they sprayed during the daytime. And these were the people who sprayed the plants I'm talking about, not the farmers. These are the people that sprayed the plants. In the daytime, you're using organics. At night, you're using the bad stuff. And they're spraying for the bugs at night using toxic chemicals, right? So yeah, when you ask me, does this industry need some regulation? Yeah, it sure does. Okay. Now, the full spectrum stuff, um, if you look down at the bottom, uh, it contains less than 0.3% THC when derived from hemp. Federal government in the farm bill we call it 2018 said, if 
you have a cultivar that has less than 0.3% THC in it, it's hemp. Uh, wow. Uh, thanks for that. Okay. That opens the door to a lot of things. Somewhere along the way, they're going to have to close these loopholes. And the loopholes also include, as Dr. Block mentioned last week, um, uh, Delta-8 THC and these things like that, because these chemists are pretty smart guys, and they're going to modify this molecule to do whatever they can to get people high. Um, uh, what else we got? Works a full spectrum works synergistically with THC and the other cannabinoids and terpenes. Okay. And then ratios and terpene content. I don't want to get into this too much because there's a lot of research now talking about the therapeutics of various cultivars are not only due to the cannabinoid content, but maybe even more due to the particular terpene profile. I think that is where some of the research is really going now. And then if you look at the bottom, some of the terpenes, you know, limonene, mood, myrcene, sedating, that kind of alpha pinene, as I mentioned, memory and alertness. Okay. We won't get too much into this because terpenes is an entire whole new type of lecture. Um, sometimes you hear them called terpenoids, right? Well, terpenes are carbon and hydrogen and terpenoids have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay? And there are hundreds of these in the plants, hundreds. And they are made for various reasons uh, by the plant for themselves, not for us. And then here, um, at the bottom is the most important thing is that therapeutics here. Uh, terpenoids may be responsible for distinction between common effects. And I think that's one of the most Im important things right here. Um, above, you know, there's the pharmacology stuff. And then, you know, that's the kind of stuff that interests some of us and bores the heck out of others. Here's terpenes. Nice little chart here. Kind of give you an idea of the aroma and what they are. If you notice this caryophyllin, on the far right, okay. Uh, the government doesn't know what to do with that because caryophyllin is a cannabinoid that has terpene properties. So they're gonna outlaw that? Well, it's in a lot of different things. So they don't know what to do. So they're just gonna ignore it, I guess, for now, right? It has ter um, terpenoid effects as well as cannabinoid type of effects. Okay, now here, here comes some of the things that if we get to the brass tacks of this thing, what important features should you look for in a product? Um, soil content, I kind of touched on that just a little bit. Is it grown organically or from conventional hemp? The extraction information is important. There are a lot of different ways to extract this. Um, there's CO2 extraction, there's alcohol, there's butane, there's ice extraction. There's all kinds of different ways to extract this. Um, and then you want to look at a, a certificate of analysis. Make sure it's third-party tested because we want to know about um, heavy metals and what we call the nasticides, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, and then molds as well. And then the amount of THC present in some of these things, ratios of cannabinoids. And at the very bottom, I believe the product should be made by professionals. And that's just my personal opinion on it. Okay. Here is the fun slide, and I promise we're almost done. Okay. This PCCA, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this. This is Professional Compounding Centers of America. They supply the compounding pharmacies. Them and Medisca and a couple of others supply most of the raw chemicals and drugs for compounders. This is where we get everything. They came up with cannabidiol greater than 98%, and that's what they call it, cannabidiol greater than 98% powder. Now, in my farms, I got some of this stuff. I wanted to, to, to some of our people to try it. I had some physicians that were very willing to prescribe it. Let's let's see what happens. Let's see if it works, okay? Um, and there's more to it than that, you know, harm reduction and all that, okay? But they came out with this after Epidiolex hit the market. And if you notice down here at the bottom, cannabidiol powder information, and this is critical. It was considered uh, an API active pharmaceutical ingredient drug by the FDA. Finished compounds required a prescription. Okay, it did. Now, remember, Epidiolex came out as, as Schedule 3, and then it went off schedule. And that's when these guys hit. Not for over-the-counter use. Had to be prescription only. 
all right, complies with Section 503A of the FDNC Act. What that means, 503A pharmacies are pharmacies that can compound for specific patients only. You can't make batches of things in anticipation of getting prescriptions. Those are manufacturers. Those are 503B facilities. You may be aware of that. Those of you, I'm, I'm sure, Dr. Clearfield, when you, when you uh, deal with hormones, that's the type of thing that is very, very uh, much in play. It's 503A facility will make it for your specific patients. Okay, you can't just have batches of it. That's important. It has to be a component of an FDA approved product. Well, Epidiolex is FDA approved and that's CBD. Okay, it's not a DEA controlled substance. Well, once it got descheduled, that criteria was met. Minimum assay, the purity, and this is the kicker, uh, the minimum has to be a 98%. The THC content less than 0.1%, synthetic and not derived from hemp or marijuana. Okay, PCCA, and forgive me, I can't remember what they derived it from, whether it was home or something. Uh, I, I'm remiss in that. But anyway, it, it doesn't matter. And it has to be free of pesticides and unwanted plant materials, no contaminants. These guys made this stuff, met all of the criteria, and the FDA came down on them, and they made them pull it. And you go, why? Well, what's the difference between this and estrogen? What, why can't you compound, you know, we compound with estrogen powder, testosterone powder. Why, why can't we do that? Well, because big pharma doesn't want you to. And so what they said, and I talked to PCCA about this because we were going to do a study together. And then they gave me the bad news. It's been pulled. Send your stuff back. Can't even sell it, what you have on the shelf. And the reason was that the FDA said, you have to prove that your product, you have to tell us how much THC is in there. And it has to be less than 1%. See what we said. THC content has to be less than 1%. And they said, we have zero. And they said, prove to us that your THC content is down to zero. They said, there are no instruments strong enough to do this. And they said, see, you can't do it. Pull the product. I was completely flabbergasted, but I guess I understand it. Okay, here comes the part that I'm just going to hit you with two slides, and this is the shameless plug for our company and what we do, and well, we make canaceuticals, and these are, you know, all of the wonderful soil grown and all of the, 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 the parameters that we go by, and we use CBD and we use cannabis, but we put in other pharmaceuticals in there like amino acids, nutraceuticals, um, homeopathics, herbs, everything in there to target specific type of needs in people. And you can see the, the um, amino acid tryptophan theanine. If anybody's ever taken theanine, it's a wonderful substance. Phenylalanine, the only amino acid that's been shown to help with pain. And it also helps tremendously, tremendous amount of studies with using this and pain in dogs as well. Okay, and then nutraceuticals, we all know about curcumin, and many people know about MSM, glucosamine, all that kind of stuff, anti-inflammatory for pain, and we just, and we make these things, okay, and then, uh, well, where do you start? What, what do I do as a practitioner, if somebody has talked to me about this, or wanted to do something, wanted to know something, or I wanted to start, or I wanted somebody to try it, then here's the kind of uh, type of thing that I think people should pay attention to, okay? And, and it's very, very similar to a lot of the stuff that we've shown on a lot of the slides, okay? And there's obviously interpatient variation and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the desired delivery system down there, if you, if you notice, I've got in there trochies, which we talked about last week, capsule sprays, that type of thing, okay? And, and it really does require a nice little conversation with your patient on what to look out for and what to do um, our company does provide that. I challenge people to go on to some of the big companies that provide CBD, call them up and ask if you can talk to the scientist or the formulator, see what you get, okay? Probably not a lot of success. 
Okay. And the last slide is, thank you very much. I hope people are still there. Um, that's name, phone number, email, and our website in, in case you want any more information or want to talk to any of us. So if anybody is there and you have any questions, we can do that. All right. Thank you very much there. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, okay. Uh, a lot of things. And I hope I answered the Joel. Do, do heavy metals cross the uh, alveolar bloodstream barrier? Oh, yes. That's, you know what? I don't have studies on that, but boy, oh boy, have I heard horror stories about this. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, and they cross the blood brain barrier, as we know, it crosses everything. Heavy metals are, are, are tiny. I mean, compared to drugs. One of the sources originally not just looking at the plant material as a contaminated source, but some of the equipment that was using for the vaping that was coming from China had a uh, heavy metal release. Wow. And uh, it was just cheaply designed stuff that was a use once and throw away. Oh, so wow. there's a lot of problem in the 2014 through 17 uh, period with um, vaporizers used in the unregulated market. Well, yeah, th thanks for that. I had forgotten about that. And then we all know about the vitamin E oil and the vapes and all of that. So yeah, there needs to be some regulation. First, I think there needs to be recognition and then regulation. These have to be recognized as products that can have some benefit. Um, or have you got aerosolized by smoking? I wish I knew. I'm going to have to tell you that I, I don't really know, but my thought is yes. And I can base this on a lot of different things. One happens to be forest fires. Okay. So there's a lot of mercury in, in topsoil in the earth. And we've dug up a lot of the earth and mercury will be released into the atmosphere and then it will fall down everywhere and it falls down in forests. And when uh, a forest fire occurs, the metals are up in that plume. And that's one of the things, I mean, when you breathe smoke from a forest fire, you're breathing a lot of nasty stuff. And that's why they get out. Okay. And it's full of metals and mercury specifically. So I think that's kind of what I'm using as an answer. Okay. Yeah, we've had quite a few of those here. You know. Oh yeah. We get we get the smoke from the California fires here. Yeah, it's California doing everybody in again. So um, there's a question with what COAS, a certificate of analysis. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, certificate of analysis. Yeah, and that and that's mandatory. And now most providers do that anyway, but. I'll tell you, that's not regulated either. You know, I mean, I can get a, I can get more than one certificate of analysis and I can have a product that looks really, really good. And I can create a product that's really, really bad. And I can post the good C of A online, right? So you can cheat. And, and that's, again, you know, that is the main reason we got into this is because we want these things to be pharmaceutically elegant. We don't want to cheat. We want therapeutic products and we want people to, to use and treat this like medicine. Okay. To follow up on my question with the vets and the responders, a lot of the respond, uh, the responders, you know, uh, law enforcement, especially they, they can't do THC. Federal right. government employees, same thing, you know, and active duty military, same thing. Um, it would we have to almost overdose them on the CBs, the CBDA, CBDG, CBD everything, da, 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 to try to bring them into without the THC? Okay. First of all, Joel, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I get this a lot. Um, it's a sad state of affairs that this is the way this is without uh, i'll say accurate monitoring the 
testing facilities and mechanisms for this are not extremely accurate and they're all over the board and they use different methodologies. So one lab can say one thing, and, and I think we've seen this in, in a lot of our, our testing anyway, where labs differ, whether it's, you know, uh, Quest, you know, versus somebody else, they, they differ. They're, it's not standardized. So some labs will report some and some will report none. Okay, so we can't take that chance. The other thing about this is that this is like, uh, a six pack of beer in one regards. You know, you can stop at the store on the way home from a stressful day at work, grab a six pack of beer, get home and have one beer and you're okay. You drink the whole six pack and you might be drooling. Okay. I, I don't want you doing anything, especially driving your car when you're in that situation. So why is it that it's, it's all or none with THC? Well, the testing is not there to figure out the effects of certain doses. And we're going to be stuck with this model. And when people ask me, well, you know, uh, your price, what, what, what do I do? You know, what if I get drug tested and all that kind of stuff? And I always tell them, look, I, I tell them very simply, if you're that concerned about it, don't do it. All right. But if you have need for this and you've had good therapeutic outcomes, results, and that type of thing, go get yourself tested and see what shows up. Because I'll tell you right now, if it's a topical type of thing like that we make for pain, you're not going to find THC in there. There's no instrument that's going to be sensitive, sensitive enough to find that. What do you mean go get tested? Well, tested. Go, go, go get drug tested. Oh, wow. wow. See how much THC you have or? Yeah, yeah. If you've been using a product, see if see if you if you pop positive. No, I you know that that goes back to when I was using. I was um, I switched from smoking to the Rick Simpson oil, and the Rick Simpson oil, according to the dispensary here, um, you know, with their certified analysis and so forth, it was supposedly around 50-50 THC CBD, and it increased mm -hmm. my appetite big time. It was pretty insane, and I didn't oh. have to do a lot. And so I was like, wow, okay. And I didn't, I didn't get high. It was pretty powerful. Yeah. And boy, oh boy, you would have, you would have popped positive on that, I would guess. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So yeah, there, there's a lot of therapeutic stuff having, you know, a lot of claims and all that with RSO um, that it's something that people have really benefited from. It wouldn't still be around if it didn't work. Right. I'm excellent. curious. Oh, I'm sorry. No, excellent talk. I'm just like blown away. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it has been. I'm curious. So why is marijuana that name uh, derogatory or where did it come from? Mexicans. Way back when, 1800s. Um, really? They were, yeah, they were all, it, it, <laughs> you can trace this crazy stuff back to Pancho Villa and that's and that's like Dr. Block said, you know, he was the he was the first one who committed terrorist acts on U.S. soil. And they said they were all high on the ganja and they called it marijuana. And I don't know whether the Mexicans did or the the Anglos did, but that's what they named it. And right now, I believe it it is racially motivated. It is a derogatory term in in my in my estimation. It. It is something that should not be called that. It is cannabis sativa L. All, everything comes from that. All cultivars, hemp even comes from that. Out of, I believe it's out of Afghan, Afghanistan way back when. I, I think Dr. Block covered that. Um, it was used various parts of the world, grown everywhere. It's a weed, grows everywhere. Uh, and, and people began to use it. And it was attributed to criminals from Mexico using marijuana. Wow, I, I never heard that. And I'm from that age group where it was, you know, marijuana. And, and mm -hmm. in the Midwest, they grew ditch weed, which was <laughs> from hemp. Yeah. 
and yeah. um, Mary yeah. Jane and Pot. Yeah. And let's, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and this and the sad thing that, to my thinking is that in the 1930s there was a pharmacist in Santa Barbara, California that led the charge to make this illegal. And if he hmm. was still alive, I'd go down there and kick his ass. <laughs> hey, by the way, by the way, I think uh, marijuana means the merry one, the happy oh. guy, the happy guy that's smiling and laughing, and and that took on racial overtones. Yeah, didn't didn't they also have um like people from foreign countries? I, I don't know whether it was like from ooh, I'll mess it up, like India or or the Indies. Something like came over and they wanted to uh, uh, stop them from coming here because they said they were all high on this. Yeah, a lot of you know political stuff that's still going on. It's it all all the bad stuff started in the '30s. Remember when uh, was it? Hearst was trying to make money off his pine forest, so they yeah. had to stop the production of hemp, and then. That's what led to the crazy stuff, man. Oh, was to make money out of trees and uh, cut down the hemp. That's what it was about. Yeah, unbelievable. Another yeah, question. What's, what's the difference? Oh, the terpenes from the plants, THC yeah. and hemp, what's the difference between them and the terpenes from regular plants and regular fruits? Great question, Joel. And that's something I have on the slide. I didn't touch on it. There are no terpenes in cannabis that are not found elsewhere. It does not have anything unique to that plant. Okay. So linalool, lavender, mm -hmm. we all know about that. Well, you know, what about um, limonene? You walk down the aisle in the, in the store, down the detergent aisle, and you're smelling limonene. Okay. I mean, these terpenes are ubiquitous. They're, they're everywhere. And th these plants do not have any that are not found somewhere else. That's a great question. Wow. wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Is that it? Can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Well, I I what I'm curious about is what fraction or component is responsible for um, culinary enhancement or um, sensory enhancement? And then um, when you um, when people imbibe, what does it do to hormonal hormonal balance? Does it throw something out? And they say, say sometimes the next day there's a withdrawal. And what does it take for the hormones to rebalance? And I well, thought that's an interesting question. Yeah, I look, look at it this way. Um, the endocannabinoid system helps balance hormones. And now we're taking phytocannabinoids, we're augmenting that. Now, if there are, and, and I'm sure there's interpatient uh, variations here. If there are people that are have hormones that aren't balanced very well, you can have an effect. There is also such a thing, and, and Dr. Clearfield, maybe you know about this, when they talk about um, uh, menstruating women, in the first part of the cycle, it takes less of the phytocannabinoids to have an effect than it does later on in the cycle. Uh, you have a higher... Uh, uh higher uh, level of estrogens in the in the yeah exactly and so somehow there is an interplay between these and remember this is trying to balance everything so you're you know when your estrogen is high sure you know we're getting balance and all that kind of stuff but also you know through neurotransmission there are breaks and that's kind of what these cannabinoids do they put the brakes on things mm-hmm what are you showing us, John? I'm showing you trochee CBD with melatonin. Goes under the lip. Yeah. Lip and the gum. So it's a quality product. Yeah. And we make something very similar, but we also put L-tryptophan in there. That's more calming. Even better. 
you, yeah. your, 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 your knowledge is really amazing, Dr. Quinn. It's yeah. great. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. thank you. If I may, if I may throw up a little bit of a downer. Oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Some of you may not know that we recently uh, had a suicide in the group. Um, and I don't know how to even proceed, but those that are involved are moving forward. And with that being said, with suicide on the rise, and not fixed. What do you think, Dr. Quinn, would be the easiest, fastest solution besides detoxification? I'm talking about throwing something in there. And I'm thinking 50 50 CBD, THC. And, and for the vets or the responders who can't do that, it's got to be some type of CBD overload with some type of supplement and hormone stabilization. I, I just, you know. Okay, well, I, I'm going to tell you this. Um, I am fully, fully on the psilocybin bandwagon. Amen, fully. me too, me too. Um, I'm now doing research on a combination product with some psilocybin in there and cannabinoids to balance the system. Right. Psilocybin is probably one of the most amazing things we have ever run across. And I say that because of the effect on the brain. It can completely knock out depression and things like that due to the, the serotonin 2A receptor, 5-HT2A. Um, there are studies done by, oh, don't draw a blank now, um, a UC San Francisco... Professor, he's a Brit. Oh, I'll come up with it. Um, and they're doing this with microdosing, which is about okay. one milligram, moderate dosing, which is 10 milligrams. Wow. And then therapeutic dosing, which is 25 milligrams. And then we have the heroic dosing, which is 50 to 100 milligrams. Now, let me tell you this. It, his study... And, and the results and the things they have gotten are phenomenal. Um, they have, I believe it is a 67% remission of treatment failed depressive patients on our standard antidepressants, whether that's tricyclics, tetracyclics, or SSRIs, SNRIs, okay? they have got a 67% remission rate using psilocybin. But I will tell you this, it's not go eat a magic mushroom. It's yeah. not do that. And, and those things basically are 1%. Um, the active compound in there is psilocin. It's, it's psilocybin is a general term. Um, Joel, I'm telling you, we have got to get this to the people. We have got to get it to them. And I'm trying to my best to research and come up with products for these people. It is a two dose system. Think about that. But it's not a take it and go away. You need to have the right, as they say, set and setting. You need to be monitored by professionals. Uh, Carhartt Harris is his name. Carhartt Harris. Okay. Um, Carhartt Harris out of UC San Francisco. Carhartt Harris. Have yeah, you heard uh, of Have you heard of Marcus Cottrell? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So if Carhartt Harris, if we can get a hold of him and possibly Harris, and they can, you know, oh, we've we, we've got this, we've, we, and we've with got all this do. that's going on, that could be huge. And the government wants this, believe it or not, in a weird way. It just yeah. has to be, you know, they have to. They, they have to. But let me let me just back up real fast to let you know that his results were done, and it is very specific. You have two professionals. One has to be a psychiatrist, and they still call it a trip. Okay, and this is not with the one milligram. The microdosing, no, not a problem. You don't even notice that. 
Right. Okay. But when you get to 10 and 25 milligrams, you start to uh, quote unquote, what, what us, us lay people call it hallucinate. It, it changes the neuronal connections. It actually can grow new neurons. It does so many things for the brain. And it is like a five to 10 hour session. And they have got it nailed. The first hour, you're just starting to come on. The second hour, you will feel anxiety. You will go through this because your circuits are rewiring. And what it does is it allows you to be more receptive to, this sounds stupid, the earth and good. And they call it, you get a feeling of oceanic boundlessness. Try to describe that. Okay. <laughs> you know, Dr. Burgess has been telling me this for years. I'll just be honest. Okay. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Then after that, your your perception of the depressive type of incidents or things or whatever goes away seem to dissipate now they get a certain result with one treatment with two treatments and it's not like the next day it's weeks later they do it again and that's it yeah You're done that's what i've heard that's what i've heard Wow. Well, that is, that is so amazing to me. So as I said, um, I want to be the guy that kind of, you know, we have researchers and, and we have practitioners. And then we got people like me in the middle that kind of want to take the research and create something for the practitioners. And that's what I want to do. And, you know, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Lewis, or I mean, Dr. Thomas Lewis and Dr. Harsfield, <laughs> and Carter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Dr. Halasa, Dr. Farshian, they're all they're on our board with us. So I, I think together, this whole group of all of you, it's, you know, and plus the body, plus Stefan, I think it's just going to grow into something that's really going to be really, well, it, it, really you know, powerful. I'm, I'm with you, Joel. I'm with you. And I, I think it's going to take um, somebody to move a mountain here. It's going to take some organization. It's going to take some dedication. It's going to take some funding. No doubt about it. Yeah, Agreed. And Agreed. that's what we have to do. So I'm I'm also working with funding people, which is extremely difficult. You know, I mean, geez. But but to me, I mean, this is this is what I'm gonna do and until the day I fall over, because I truly believe that there is a need and we can fill that need without doing things that are forced down our throats. Amen. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Dr. Clearfield, it's all up to you. We were all there. We go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> no, no worries. I'll have, I'll have this. I'll have this licked by Thursday. Okay. Yeah. No, no pressure. Um, uh, it's okay. Okay. I have one more question for Doctor Quinn. When people get COVID, I believe it throws people out of balance. Yeah. So what you're talking about is psilocybin. Can that help rebalance them or bring them back to normality a little quicker? Yeah, um, the, Dr. Carhart Harris, I believe, was the one speaking about this and saying that, yeah, definitely it does. It does. I mean, COVID, uh, you know, HIV, anything that is throwing off, and, and I don't know that much about the brain, you know, I mean, I know a little bit about the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, but I don't know all this other stuff that these guys know, these neuropsychiatrists and all of this stuff, neurologists. And they have got this nail to where these things act in the brain. And they will tell you, you know, COVID here, you know, affects a substantial nigra. You know, they, they, got all, they got all this stuff nailed. And then they can tell you, this is where it acts. And this is how it does it. And, and of course, you know, well, what we, we got to get them as speakers. Oh, oh, boy. <laughs> you know, it, it will blow you away. It will blow you away. If, if you're... If you want to get down into the weeds <laughs> and and find out about this, you can do it. Um, if you'd like, and Joel, I want to do this for you. I, I'm going to see if I can come up with some of these studies and send them to you. But the problem is they're so detailed. They're so in-depth, you know, because that's kind of what the scientific community demands. 
And like I said, there we got the patients and the people treating the patients on one side. We got the researchers and scientists on the other side. And what is that thing they say? It, it can take, in medical practice, it can take more than 10 years, sometimes 20 years to get from the bench to the bedside. That's where we are. You know, there's a, there, there's so much going on. Dr. Harsfield has a whole bunch of stuff going on in Arkansas. Dr. Yeah. Halasa has a whole lot going on in um, his area. And I think even Florida. Yeah, I, I know yeah. it's Florida. Stefan Hartman, he has a lot going on, you know, and then you've got the body in mm -hmm. Michigan. So we just got to keep spreading all this stuff together and we'll, we'll figure it out. And yeah, I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Um, yeah, me too. Dr. Clearfield, is, is there any other stuff I didn't look? There's a bunch of stuff uh, that's like in the chat. I don't know. Uh, no, no, I think we covered it all. Uh, okay, good. Let me look one more time. I think we got it all. Yep. Uh, yeah, we got we got it all. So oh, excellent, excellent. So Thank on the last slide, if anybody needs to get a hold of me, and my reputation is that I'll talk to anybody anytime about anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I knew you were like I said when we started. I knew you were serious because you had a shirt on tonight. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's the dress code. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much. And 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 like I said, this was last minute. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. Otherwise, they'd have to listen to me. <laughs> the, that's, you know, uh, you know, for whatever, whether that's worth. Next week, we have some, I know it's, I know it's Halloween. Oh. But we have somebody very special. Um, Dr. David, and I, I'm going to not pronounce his name correctly, Ajabi who is the director of the Brain and Body Foundation. Um, his specialty is sickle cell anemia and dementia. Mm -hmm. um, he's um, uh, a community educator for the um, uh, Alzheimer's uh, 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 Association. And he is the host of Africa's number one rated television show. Oh, wow. So he, uh, he is um, going to be dynamite. So spread the word. I'll try to get it, get it out to as many as possible. Um, and it should be extremely interesting. Oh, that's so, excellent. That's okay. 74 in Vegas right now. 74 in Vegas, and you're wearing a shirt. Yeah, it's, <laughs> cold. it's cold. It's <laughs> cold. I'm glad we did that. Okay, anybody else have any comments or questions? Uh, wait, something else in the chat? Hold on. Uh, great talk, Robert. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, everybody. So again, next week, uh, Doctor. I hope I'm saying it right. Ajabi. Uh, um, and uh, John, you got anything for us? Everything's beautiful. Love to talk. Thanks. Okay. okay. And um, uh, Dawn, it was great seeing you. Dawn lives in Houston. I was in Houston this week for the AMMG meeting, um, and we had a, a a great time there. So. Um, and um, anybody else have any comments, questions? Uh, any anybody have any word on on peptides? That of course was a big topic down there, since they have a whole course on peptides. So, um, I missed I missed that Zoom with Stefan Hartman and the uh, the body. So did I. Yeah. It, did you Did you get to see a doc? Me no, I missed it also. I'll, I'll get a hold of Stefan and see if he can send me a recording. And then we put it up on your website. And so, so the week, so the week after Dr. Ajabi's next week, the week after that, November seventh, I'm going to have Jay Campbell coming on again, and you know he's uh, big in the uh, peptide world. Right, right. He, oh, good. He was even mentioned in a in a hit piece in the Wall Street Journal last Friday. So, <laughs> um, I I think I have the links cool. there if anybody wants wants it. So, so. Um, they were not favorable to, towards him. So, but you know, he's, oh, no. he's a, a, a rather interesting and passionate uh, uh, person also. So that's our next two weeks. And we'll see you um, next time, next week, same time, same station. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you thank so you much. much. And I'll be sending you, Bob, the, the participant list shortly. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you next week, same time, same station. All right. Good night. Good night.